Good afternoon. My name is Kim Stanger. Thanks for participating in our webinar today. Today we're going to be talking about Imtala. Uh, Imtala, one of my favorite topics, along with Stark and HIPAA and all of those other acronyms. Uh, we're going to be covering the following issues today. To whom and when Imtala applies? What requirements apply to hospitals with an emergency department? Which requirements apply to hospitals that receive Imtala transfers? What do you do about patients who refuse exam or treatment? On-call responsibilities for physicians, documentation requirements, and avoiding Imtala penalties. As part of the presentation, you should have received a link with written materials. We've given you a copy of the PowerPoint slides, also a copy of the Imtala statute and the regulation, and perhaps most importantly at all, of all, the Imtala Interpretive Guidelines from CMS. If you haven't read those, I'd really encourage you to read those because that's the Bible when it comes to addressing Imtala issues. I've also given you an article that I drafted and some uh, sample in, uh, Imtala policies and forms. Like all of our presentations, this presentation will be recorded and available for download at our blog. And if you have questions during the program or afterwards, feel free to uh, shoot me an email or you can use the chat feature on this presentation and I will respond to you. Just make sure you let me know that it's in conjunction with the, the webinar. Uh, as far as preliminaries, as with our other programs, this program provides an overview of the relevant laws. Imtala is a federal statute, so it applies across the board, but it's possible that your particular state may have some additional requirements. For example, uh, in some states, they may have their own version of Imtala, and you want to make sure that you comply with your own state laws. In addition, uh, courts in various jurisdictions interpret Imtala, and so you may have federal courts in one jurisdiction that interprets it a, a, a slightly different way than in another jurisdiction, so you should be aware of what your particular courts may um, have decided when it comes to Imtala. Finally, make sure that you know what your local CMS region uh, addresses how they view the Imtala issues. Uh, usually they're fairly consistent, but I have had situations where the Imtala views are a little bit different between various uh, regions. The bottom line there is when it comes time to actually applying these principles to a particular fact, you may want to check with somebody who knows the particular circumstances of your jurisdiction. With that said, let's talk about Imtala, which is the Emergency Treatment and Active Labor Act of 1986. Imtala is comprised of the statute and also the regulations, particularly the regulations of 42 CFR 49.20 and 49.24. Those are part of your Medicare provider agreement. Some of you may be scratching your head and say, how in the world can the uh, federal government require us to provide care to these indigent people and others who show up at the emergency department? Isn't that an unfunded mandate? That's just simply not fair. Why should the government have the ability to do that? Well. The answer is, if you agree to participate in Medicare, if you want money from the government through the Medicare program, there are always strings attached. One of those strings is, if you are a participating hospital, then you've got to comply with the EMTALA rules, the regulations, and you should comply with the EMTALA interpretive guidelines, which are all set out in the Medicare State Operations Manual, Appendix 5, which I have provided to you. Well, to whom does EMTALA apply? Well, EMTALA applies to hospitals that participate in Medicare and physicians who respond to a potential emergency medical conditions, including on-call services. Let's go back to the hospitals. EMTALA applies to hospitals, not all hospitals, only those hospitals that participate in Medicare. If you're sick and tired of EMTALA and those obligations, then you can opt out of Medicare, and if you don't take any Medicare, then you don't have to worry about EMTALA, but that's not very many hospitals these days. Now, the EMTALA requirements differ depending on whether you are a hospital with a dedicated emergency department or just simply another hospital with specialized capabilities. If you are a hospital with, dedicated, with a dedicated emergency department, then you're subject to kind of the full EMTALA gamut. So what's a dedicated emergency department? There's a three-part test. You have a dedicated emergency department if you have a licensed emergency room or department, or even if you don't have a licensed emergency room, if you operate a, a place, a clinic or urgent care clinic that's set out to the public as a place that provides emergency care without a prior appointment, 
then that may be deemed to be a dedicated emergency department under EMTALA and would trigger your EMTALA obligations. In the commentary that the government's issued, they have indicated that most provider-based urgent care centers or labor and delivery departments constitute dedicated emergency departments because you're typically holding those out as places patients can come for emergency type services without a pre-scheduled appointment. Even if you don't hold out to the public as that kind of place, if in effect you're operating that way, then you could also be deemed to have a dedicated emergency department. If during the prior calendar year, you provided at least one third of your outpatient visits for emergency conditions on an urgent basis without a prior appointment, then you are deemed to have a dedicated emergency department and you have full uh, requirements. You've got to comply with all of the requirements under EMTALA, including providing screening exams and the like. Now, if you do not have a dedicated emergency department, you don't have to comply with full EMTALA, but if you're a participating in the hospital, you still have to agree to receive transfers from another participating hospital if you have specialized capabilities. So even if you are a specialty hospital, you don't operate in a dedicated emergency department, if you have specialized capabilities, maybe you are an orthopedic hospital or something like that, and you participate in Medicare, you are obligated to receive transfers from these other facilities. If you fail to do that, then you can be held liable for EMTALA violations. What are the penalties that can rain down for EMTALA violations? Well, you can be terminated from your, uh, from participating in Medicare and Medicaid. Remember that uh, EMTALA is part of your participation agreement. So if you're violating that, if you're violating the conditions of participation, you can be terminated from Medicare. In addition, hospitals and physicians can get hit up with civil penalties. Hospitals, if you have less than 100 beds, you can get hit up with a $25,000 fine per violation. If you have 100 or more beds, then it's $50,000 fine per violation. If you're a physician, it's a $50,000 fine per violation. You might have a situation in which your on-call physicians are declining to respond or failing to respond per their obligations. You can remind them that, hey, physicians, you can get hit up with a civil fine of $50,000 per violation. In addition, if you're a hospital, you could also be sued for damages from individuals who suffer personal harm because you failed to comply with EMTALA. Maybe you dumped the patient, you turned them away, and that patient suffers injury. They could sue you. Also, if you improperly transferred the patient over to somebody else or failed to accept the patient, that patient went someplace else, that other facility incurred damages because they have paid for that care, then that other facility can come back and sue you also. It's only the hospitals can be sued for damages. Individuals, uh, physicians can't be sued for damages under EMTALA. Uh, all right, what generally are the EMTALA requirements? Well, if you're a hospital with a dedicated emergency department, you must provide an emergency medical screening exam and if that exam reveals an emergency medical condition, you've got to provide stabilizing treatment or an appropriate transfer. If you are a hospital with specialized capabilities, you don't have to provide that initial screening exam uh, to patients who show up, but you do have an obligation to accept transfers of an unstabilized patient from another facility. Uh, you cannot delay exam or treatment to inquire about payment. You must post required signage. You must maintain certain required documentation, all of which we will talk about as we go through our program today. So let's talk about EMTALA application. For hospitals with a dedicated emergency department, EMTALA is triggered if the patient comes to the emergency department or comes to the hospital, we'll talk about what that means, a request is made for emergency care and the person is not already a patient at the hospital. That's when EMTALA is triggered if you are a hospital with a dedicated emergency department. If you are a hospital without a dedicated emergency department, such as a specialty hospital, and TALA is triggered if you participate in Medicare, you have specialized capabilities that the transferring facility doesn't have, and you receive a request for transfer from that other facility. Let's talk about dedicated emergency departments and hospitals with dedicated emergency departments. And TALA only applies if the patient comes to the emergency department. Now, comes to the emergency department is defined broadly to include 
They come to the main campus of the hospital, including the parking lot, sidewalk, or driveways, or they're in an area within 250 yards of the hospital that is owned by the hospital, including provider-based departments of the hospital, or if you are in an off-campus facility owned by the hospital and that off-campus location has a dedicated emergency department, like an urgent care center, labor and delivery, something like that. If you satisfy those, then you're deemed to, that patient is deemed to be on hospital property and EMTALA is triggered. Now, the following areas are not considered part of the hospital for purposes of EMTALA. Therefore, if the patient shows up at these locations, EMTALA is not necessarily triggered. Areas or structures that are not part of the hospital, including physician offices, rural health clinics, skilled nursing facilities, or other entities, even if they're owned by the hospital, if they're operated, um, if they're not operated under the hospital's provider number, then they're not deemed to be part of the hospital for purposes of EMTALA. The patient may show up there, there may be a malpractice obligation, but there's no EMTALA, EMTALA obligation if the patient shows up at those other entities. The key there is whether or not that other entity is operated as provider-based, as a provider-based department of the hospital. If they are, then hey, you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the other. If you want provider-based reimbursement, hospital-based reimbursement for that location, and you want, and therefore you're going to bill it as provider-based, then you're going to assume the EMTALA obligations. On the other hand, if it's not billed as provider-based, not operated under the hospital's provider number, but is a separate unit from the hospital, then in that situation, EMTALA doesn't apply there, even though the, the, uh, the patient shows up there. Also, EMTALA does not apply to an off-campus facility that's owned by the hospital if that off-campus facility does not have a dedicated emergency department. So you might have a, the, the hospital may operate a physician clinic. It's off the hospital's campus, outside that 250 yards of the area, located in another part of town. Patient shows up there. As long as it does not operate as a dedicated emergency department, doesn't have a dedicated emergency department, EMTALA does not apply to that particular situation. What about ambulances? Well, if the air or ground ambulance is owned and operated by your, by your hospital, then it's deemed to be part of you. That means if the patient's in the hospital ambulance, the patient's at the hospital, that means the EMTALA is triggered and you gotta jump through the EMTALA rules. You gotta provide the screening exam and appropriate um, stabilizing treatment or an appropriate transfer. Now, uh, EMTALA applies to your hospital if the patient is in your ambulance unless it's operated under a community-wide EMS protocol that directs it to a different hospital or a, that that uh, protocol is at the direction of a physician from a different hospital. If you can document that, then EMTALA does not necessarily apply. Now, if the ambulance is not owned and operated by the hospital, then just because the patient's in your ambulance doesn't mean that EMTALA is triggered. However, if the ambulance is not owned and operated by your hospital, EMTALA applies if it's on your property or if the hospital's inbound. There's a uh, Ninth Circuit case that held that if the ambulance is inbound, you cannot divert that inbound ambulance unless you're on diversionary status. So if the patient's in an inbound ambulance, even if you don't own it, then you generally can't divert them unless you're on diversionary status. Diversionary status means that you lack staff or facilities to accept additional emergency patients. Your capacity depends on things such as your staff equipment supplies, the number and availability of your beds, and your past practices in accommodating additional patients in excess of occupancy limits. So for example, if you have in the past um, when your emergency room is full, you started putting people in some other areas of the hospital, then that would go into factoring in your capacity. If you've done it in the past, then you would be expected to have capacity to do it now. Now, your lack of capacity may depend upon the particular circumstances. It may be that you lack capacity for certain types of services, so you are on divert for certain types of services. You may be able to get away with it there. The key there is if you are going to go on diversionary status, you need to make sure that you document it. So here's the practical rules regarding diversion. Generally, you may divert persons who are not on hospital property and who are not in an ambulance. 
So you've got the, the patient calls in, says, hey, I'm delivering, I'm on I-5, I'm driving into your facility right now. That patient's not in an ambulance, not on hospital property. You can divert him. You can send him someplace else. Now, if that patient disregards your, your direction and shows up at your facility, they are now on hospital property and you've got to take care of them. On the other hand, if that person is in an ambulance, you can't divert them unless you're on diversionary status. Now, it may be a situation where you know that that patient needs services that you cannot provide, and that patient is going to be better served if that ambulance goes directly to that, uh, that emergency trauma center or something like that. That's fine. You can discuss that with the, the ambulance driver. You can tell them that that patient needs services that you can't provide. If they bring the patient to your facility, you're only going to have to provide the exam and then ship them out to the other facility, and that's just going to um, not be in the best interest of patient care. You can have those discussions with the ambulance, but do not divert them unless you're on diversionary status. You can always discuss proper care. But say something to the effect of, look, we are not diverting you. If you come here, we will provide the best care we can, but this patient really needs care at this other location. We are not diverting you. If you bring them here, we will take care of them, but they really need to go to that other location, and that's completely fine. You will just want to document that. Otherwise, you may get the claim from the ambulance that you were diverted to this other facility, and that other facility may not like that. They may call threatening an intel violation. Well, what about helipads? Well, if the patient's brought to your hospital for exam or treatment prior to transport to another facility, then again, EMTAL applies, and you've got to provide the appropriate screening exam. If that screening exam reveals an emergency medical condition, you've got to provide stabilizing treatment or an appropriate transfer. The rule is a little bit different if all you are is a helipad, all you are is an airport. In that situation, if the other facility already examined the person and your hospital's helipad is used merely for transportation purposes, you're just the bus stop, then EMTALA does not apply unless that patient's condition deteriorates while you're on, they're on your property and they request care from your particular facility. So the first thing is, in order to trigger EMTALA, that patient has to be on hospital property or in an inbound ambulance. The second thing is, um, that person has to present a dedicated emergency department, and they have to request, well, let me back up. Um, if they are on hospital property, then EMTALA is triggered if there's a request for emergency care, okay? Now, the difference, there's a different standard depending upon where they show up. If the patient presents at the dedicated emergency department, which could be an urgent care center or labor and delivery, and as well as in the ED, then EMTALA is triggered if they request exam or treatment for a medical condition. If they're unable to speak, the test is whether a prudent layperson would believe that the person needs exam or treatment for a medical condition, basically any condition. On the other hand, if they don't show up at the dedicated emergency department, if they show up at some other place, some other area of the hospital, the standard's a little bit different. If they're showing up outside the dedicated emergency department, then the test is whether or not the person shows up uh, and requests exam or treatment for a potential emergency condition. So if they're in your ED, it's if they're basically requesting any care, you got to jump through the Intella hoops. If they're showing up outside your emergency department, then it's, the test is in any condition, it's whether or not they have a potential emergency condition. If they're unable to speak, whether a prudent layperson would believe that the person needs the exam or treatment for a potential emergency medical condition. If EMTALA does not apply to requests for clearly non-emergency care. So if the patient shows up just simply as part of some kind of preventative care program, like shows up for a flu shot or immunization, some kind of community outreach program where they're, you're giving away free blood pressure checks. In those situations, EMTALA generally does not apply unless in the course of providing that service, you come across or there's an indication that this person might have an emergency condition, then in that situation, EMTALA would apply. So you're doing some kind of community outreach where you will do free blood pressure screenings, people come in. If that person has extremely high blood pressure, EMTALA may be triggered at that particular point in time. EMTALA does not apply to requests to perform non-emergency tests like blood pressure or x-ray, or to gather evidence like a blood alcohol content test, sexual assault, et cetera. 
or a pre-scheduled appointment by the physician. The physician may say, especially in smaller communities, hey, I want to uh, go ahead and provide care. I've made an appointment. Go show up at the ED and they'll do your x-ray. If it's part of a pre-scheduled appointment, then EMTALA generally does not apply there. But again, EMTALA may be triggered if, in the course of providing that scheduled treatment or that preventative care, uh, if it appears that this person does have an emergency condition, then EMTALA needs to may trigger that. In these situations, the key here to avoid EMTALA sanctions is to make sure that you document that the person showed up and requested non-emergent care, that they didn't show up as the ED to receive care, it was for this non-emergent stuff. Make sure that the record documents that. Well, what about infants? Hey, if that infant's born at your facility, that infant has now come to your facility for purposes of EMTALA. That means EMTALA applies to that baby. If the infant is born alive at the hospital, EMTALA applies. The hospital must provide the exam, stabilizing treatment, and or an appropriate transfer. If there's a request for exam or treatment, or the prudent person would believe that that infant needs the exam or treatment. Now, EMTALA does not apply to people who are already patients of the hospital. That seems kind of screwy. But remember the background of EMTALA was to protect those people who show up at the hospital who aren't otherwise patients of the hospital. Once you accept that person as a patient, you don't need EMTALA because you've got malpractice. You've got duties under the malpractice laws. You've got duties under the conditions of participation and the like. And those will protect the patient. EMTALA was designed to protect those patients who show up and you never assume the duty. And therefore, you didn't have those obligations. Once you assume that duty, then generally EMTALA ends. Therefore, EMTALA ends once the person is admitted as an inpatient in good faith. So, and that's defined as admitted for bed occupancy with the expectation that the person will remain overnight. Once you admit that patient in good faith, EMTALA ends. You can transfer the patient, you can send them home, you can discharge them, whatever you want to do, so long as they are admitted in good faith. If you violate, if you do something wrong, if you violate the standard of care, that's malpractice. You can get sued up for malpractice. If you discharge them inappropriately, you can get hit up with fines for improper discharges under the conditions of participation, but it's not an EMTALA violation. Similarly, EMTALA does not apply if the person has, is an outpatient, has begun receiving outpatient services other than uh, emergency care. So, patient shows up for a cardiac stress test. In the middle of their cardiac stress test, they grab their chest and keel over. EMTALA would not apply to that patient if they were showed up as part of a pre-scheduled outpatient service. They'd already begun receiving that service. Um, your Malpractice obligations would apply, your conditions of uh, participation would apply, so they don't need EMTALA. EMTALA does not apply even if an emergency arises after the person has been admitted or after the outpatient services begin. If the person comes to the hospital with a dedicated emergency department and there's a request for examination or treatment and the person is not already, not already an inpatient or outpatient at the hospital, then Intel is triggered, the hospital with a dedicated emergency department must provide an appropriate medical screening exam to determine whether the person has an emergency medical condition. And if the person has an emergency medical condition, they've got to provide stabilizing treatment or an appropriate transfer. This decision tree explains it. So the patient has come to your facility, you've got an obligation to provide a medical screening exam. If that medical screening exam shows that there is no emergency medical condition, EMTALA ends. You may be wrong. You may have violated your standard of care and be liable for malpractice, but as far as EMTALA is concerned, if you provide an appropriate screening exam and that screening exam did not reveal an emergency medical condition, then EMTALA ends. You may transfer the patient, you may discharge the patient, you don't have to worry about EMTALA. On the other hand, if you perform the screening exam and you determine there is an emergency medical condition, then you've got to provide either stabilizing treatment and or an appropriate transfer. Let's talk about the medical screening exam. An appropriate medical screening exam has to satisfy three criteria. First, it has to be performed by qualified medical personnel or QMPs. Under EMTALA, these are persons who have been identified in documents approved by the governing body to be able to 
perform the medical screening exam. That could be physicians, it could be mid-levels, it could even be, in some cases, nurses, especially labor and delivery nurses. But in order to be a QMP under EMTALA, they have to be approved to provide those services in some document, policy, bylaws, whatever it is, some documents approved by the governing body. So you have some kind of policy, presumably, that would say, in our facility, in our emergency department, uh, mid-levels and physicians can perform screening exams. In our labor and delivery, physicians, mid-levels, and labor and delivery nurses can perform screening exams. It has to be approved by the governing body. Second factor, in order for this medical screening exam to be appropriate, it has to be applied in a non-discriminatory manner. That doesn't mean everybody gets the same test. It's that everybody who shows up with the same signs or symptoms would get the same test regardless of their ability to pay. So you do not differ based on payment status, condition, race, national origin, disability, et cetera, but you do distinguish based on their presenting symptoms. And that the third factor is that medical screening exam has to be sufficient to allow the QMT to determine with reasonable clinical confidence whether an emergency condition exists. The type of screening exam you give is going to depend on the presenting signs and symptoms and the hospital's capabilities, including the availability of on-call physicians. All of that is going to be going to determine whether or not you gave an appropriate medical screening exam. You have to provide a screening exam within the capabilities of the hospital, including on-call physician, specialty services you may have, um, uh, specialty equipment, diagnostic tests, anything like that that's necessary based on the presenting signs or symptoms. When it comes to doing the screening exam, the screening exam is an ongoing process. It is not an isolated event. This is one of the more common citations that I've seen for EMTALA violations. You may have a situation where the patient comes in, they are triaged, but triage is not a screening exam. Triage is just to determine the priority of the screening exam. You, in addition to triage, you've also got to conduct and document an appropriate screening exam. That screening exam is an ongoing process. It continues with the initial triage, but continues until the patient's stabilized, admitted, or transferred. So the government, if they come in, they're going to want to see that you continue to monitor that particular patient. Your screening exam should normally include vital signs, history, documented physical exam or the involved area or system. If needed, appropriate ancillary tests and specialists available through the hospital, like lab tests, diagnostic tests, and so forth, and continued monitoring. Patient comes in at 0100, you did vitals then, but then you sent the, home, the patient home at 0300 with no indication that you provided any further monitoring or any checking before the patient left, that could potentially be an EMTALA violation. When it comes to the screening exam, I cannot overemphasize the importance of documentation. Remember, if it's not in the chart, it didn't happen. That is particularly true when it comes to the government evaluating EMTALA compliance. That chart should show that there was an appropriate exam, that if there was no emergency condition, that that is documented, or if the patient stabilized, that that's documented in the chart. If the patient refused care or requested to transfer, document that. Or if you're transferring them because the physician certifies benefits outweigh the risk, make sure all of that appears in the chart. I am convinced in 90% of the EMTALA cases with which I deal, there was no EMTALA violation, but there was a failure to document. You want to make sure that the documentation is there. Now, the screening exam is done to determine whether or not there's an emergency medical condition. What is an emergency medical condition? It's defined as a condition manifesting itself by acute symptoms of sufficient severity, including severe pain, psychiatric disturbances, and or substance abuse, such that the absence of immediate medical attention could reasonably be expected to result in placing the individual's health in serious jeopardy, serious impairment to bodily functions, or serious dysfunction of any bodily organ or part. If you want to know whether or not that patient has an emergency condition, that is the test. In the case of pregnancy, 
In the case of pregnant women having contractions, they have an emergency condition if either there's inadequate time to effect a safe transfer to another hospital before delivery or the transfer may pose a threat to health or safety of a woman or unborn child. A woman in labor is, uh, is presumed to have an emergency medical condition and that means that you can't transfer them out, including discharging them home, unless you jump through the EMTALA hoops. Now, labor for purposes of EMTALA means the process of childhood, be, uh, childbirth, beginning with latent or early labor and continuing through the delivery of placenta. I understand that that is not the clinical definition, that clinical de definition would mean that there is some dilation of the cervix to a certain degree before it's deemed to be labor, but that's not the standard when it comes to EMTALA. EMTALA begins with latent or early labor and continues through the delivery of the placenta. A woman experiencing contractions is presumed to be in labor unless a qualified medical person acting within the scope of their practice certifies false labor after a reasonable period of observation. So a patient comes in, they're experiencing labor, you think that they're in early stages of labor but you haven't ruled out false labor, then you, that person has an emergency medical condition and you can't send them home, can't transfer them unless you jump through the appropriate EMTALA hoops. What about psychiatric conditions? Well, according to the guidelines, an individual has an emergency medical condition for psychiatric conditions if they're expressing suicidal or homicidal thoughts or gestures or they're determined to be dangerous to themselves or others. What about substance abuse? Well, at least here in Region 10, they said that some intoxicated individuals may meet the definition of having an emergency medical condition because the absence of medical treatment may place their health in serious jeopardy. Further, intoxicated individuals frequently have unrecognized trauma. Well, what about uh, if this person clearly has a non-emergent condition? Well, the, the interpretive guidelines confirm that the hospital need only perform a screening exam that's necessary to rule out an emergency medical condition based on the presenting symptoms. So if that patient comes in and the nature of the request makes it clear that their medical condition is not of an emergency nature, the hospital isn't required to jump through the full hoops of doing a full-blown workup. Instead, they can satisfy their EMTALA obligations simply by doing what would be reasonable under the circumstances to rule out an emergency condition. For example, the hospital is only required to perform such screening as would be appropriate to determine that the individual doesn't have an emergency medical condition. In the case of obvious non-emergency situation, the person's statement that they are not seeking emergency to get care, together with brief questioning by the QMP, would be sufficient to rule out an emergency medical condition. The key there is documented. Make sure that you provide an appropriate screening exam based on the person's symptoms. If the medical screening exam reveals no emergency medical condition, then EMTALA ends. You may transfer the patient, you may discharge the patient home, it's not an EMTALA issue. But you need to document that there was no emergency medical condition because hindsight is always 20-20. If that patient subsequently has an adverse outcome or the patient's condition devolves or, or uh, disintegrates, then at that particular point, the government may come in there and conclude either you didn't provide an appropriate screening exam or that that patient really did have an emergency medical condition. Make sure that you document if the patient doesn't have an, exam, uh, a medical, uh, an emergency medical condition. If that medical screening exam reveals an emergency medical condition, then you've got to provide either stabilizing treatment or an appropriate transfer. Let's talk about stabilizing treatment. If the screening exam reveals an emergency medical condition, you've got to provide either stabilizing treatment within its capabilities or an appropriate transfer. Stabilizing treatment is defined as such care necessary to assure, within reasonable medical probability, that no material deterioration of the condition is likely to result from or occur during transfer from the facility, or in the case of a pregnant woman, delivery of the child and the placenta. You've either got to provide stabilizing treatment or an appropriate transfer. A transfer is any time you move the patient from your facility, whether they're discharged home, whether they're uh, moved to another entity, movement within your facility is not a transfer, and so you don't have to jump through the EMTALA hoops for movement within your facility. 
EMTALA ends once the patient is stabilized or is admitted as an inpatient. You want to document if the patient is stabilized because if the patient is stable, then EMTALA ends and you can't be liable for an EMTALA violation. You may be liable for malpractice, you could be liable for a violation of the conditions of participation, but it should not be an EMTALA issue as long as that patient really was stabilized and you documented the same. Now, it's important to understand what is considered stable, and the standard's a little bit different depending on whether or not you're talking about stable for transfer to another facility or stable for discharge home. Under the regulation, stabilized is defined as that there's no material deterioration of the condition is likely within a reasonable medical probability to result from or occur during the transfer or as a result of the transfer, or for a pregnant woman delivery of the child in the placenta. That is the test for stabilized. Now, that's under the regulation. Under the interpretive guidelines that CMS has issued, I would argue that the standard's a little bit different. Under the regulations, it's just whether or not you could transfer that person from point A to point B without a material deterioration of their condition. Under the interpretive guidelines, however, the government says that the person is stabilized if the emergency medical condition has resolved, even though the underlying medical condition may persist. So maybe that patient comes in with a severe allergy uh, or asthma uh, attack. Um, you're able to stabilize the, that condition, even though the patient still has asthma. Um, if you stabilize that condition, then the patient's stable. For psychiatric conditions, a person's stabilized for transfer if they're protected and prevented from harming themselves or others. In the interpretive guidelines, they've said the restraints may temporarily stabilize, but just don't rely on, on uh, restraints alone because they may mean that that condition really hasn't resolved. So be careful when you're transferring a psychiatric patient. That's the standard for stable for transfer to another facility. What about stable for discharge home? The standard there is Within reasonable clinical confidence, the patient has reached a point where their continued care, including diagnostics or treatment, could reasonably be performed as an outpatient or later as an inpatient, provided that the patient is given a plan for appropriate follow-up care as part of the discharge instructions, or for psychiatric conditions that the patient is no longer a threat to themselves or others. Remember, discharging the patient home is a transfer. That means you can't discharge the patient home, even pregnant women, unless they are stable or you have jumped, uh, that discharge is an appropriate transfer for purposes of EMTALA. When it comes to stable for discharge or transfer, again, the key is to document. Document that the patient's condition is stable. And I would actually put that language in your records. Uh, in the case of pregnancy, for a pregnant woman in labor, stabilized means that she delivered the child in the placenta. That means that if a woman is having contractions, you've either got to deliver the baby or the placenta, or you must perform an appropriate transfer, including discharge back home. In order for that transfer to be appropriate, you've got to satisfy the transfer requirements that we'll talk about in just a minute. Remember, false labor must be certified by a QMP after a reasonable period of observation. You can't just assume that this patient has false labor you've got to have a QMP certified false labor before you can send the patient home. If you send them home without that certification, that patient was in labor, meaning they were having contractions, then that is potentially an improper transfer under EMTALA. Well, what about stabilizing treatment? The hospital must provide stabilizing treatment within its capabilities. Capabilities, again, means physical facilities, equipment and services available at the hospital. It also means appropriate staff, including on-call staff. If the patient's stabilized, the hospital may admit, discharge, or transfer the patient in TALA ends once the patient is stabilized, but you better make sure that you document it. If the, patient's, if the hospital's unable to stabilize the patient, the hospital must effect an appropriate transfer. What is an appropriate transfer? If the patient's not stabilized, the hospital may not transfer or discharge the patient home unless you satisfy one of the two following criteria. Either one of the following occurs and the transfer has to be appropriate. The first test, either one of the following occurs. Either you've got to have the person or their personal representative requesting the transfer to another facility or 
you've got to have your physician certify that the benefits of that transfer outweigh the risks. No matter which of those you use, you've also got to make sure that that transfer is appropriate under the regulations. Remember, the transfer is any movement outside the hospital at the direction of hospital personnel, including the discharge home. It is not if the person leaves AMA, and it's not movement within or between the same hospital. That's not a transfer. For anything, with any time you're transferring or discharging the patient outside your facility, if that patient's not stabilized, you've got to jump through the transfer hoops. Well, what about if the patient requests a transfer? Well, of course, the patient has their or their legally authorized representative may request a transfer under EMTALA. They say that if the patient requests a transfer, you still have to document certain information. You've got to document that you inform the patient concerning their EMTALA rights and the risk of the transfer. In addition, you should make good faith efforts to get the patient to sign a written request for the transfer that documents the reason for the requested transfer and that the patient is aware of the risks and the benefits of the transfer. So you want to try to get the patient to sign a transfer request form. Alternatively, if you don't have that patient request, you can transfer the patient if the physician certifies that the benefits of the transfer outweigh the risks. Note that this physician certification has to be completed by a physician. A mid-level cannot complete this certification. If the mid-level is available but the physician's not at the facility, the mid-level can call and consult with the physician, and the physician can go ahead and certify that the benefits outweigh the risks. The, the mid-level can go ahead and sign the discharge or transfer orders, but the physician has to countersign. That certification, regardless, that physician certification has to summarize the, the reason, the risks and benefits of the transfer, state that based on the information available at the time, the medical benefits outweigh the risk, the physician has to sign it, and they can't backdate it. Uh, sometimes uh, I've seen some hospitals that will just have a physician certification form that just says benefits outweigh the risks. I've had the, the EMTALA surveyors say that's not sufficient. We want to see actual documentation to show that the physician actually considered what the benefits and the risks were. So document what those benefits and the risks were, that you had that conversation, and that you certified that the benefits outweigh the risks. Whether you get the patient consent for the transfer or the patient request for the transfer, or you get the patient or the physician certifying benefits outweigh the risk, you've still got to make sure that that transfer is appropriate. An appropriate transfer under EMTALA must satisfy four criteria. First, that the transferring hospital has to provide treatment within its capability to minimize the risk of the harm to the patient during the transfer. Second, the transferring hospital has to contact the receiving facility to confirm that the receiving facility has available space and qualified personnel and that the facility agrees to accept the transfer. You may want to document who it was you spoke with at the receiving facility. If you are the receiving facility, you may want to make sure that you control who has the authority to accept transfers on behalf of your facility. Sometimes you will have physician-to-physician -physician contact where the transferring facility calls the um, receiving, uh, the specialist at the receiving facility, the, the re the specialist says, yeah, send them over, but nobody contacted the hospital to make sure that the hospital really has the beds. Um, if you are the receiving facility, you will want to make sure that you, that those calls are coming into the right people so that you can make that assessment. Third factor, the transferring hospital has to send uh, the relevant records that are available at the time. If uh, the transfer is necessary because an on-call physician failed to respond, you've got to send the name of that on-call physician to the receiving facility so the receiving facility can report it to the government. And if you don't have all the records available at the time, you've got to send additional records that are necessary within a reasonable time after the effect of transfer. The fourth factor is the transfer has to be effected through qualified personnel with proper equipment, including life support measures as required and appropriate for that particular patient situation. The hospital is not required to maintain EMS to transfer patients. But if the patient's condition requires it, you should take appropriate steps to secure EMS. I get the question sometimes, well, what about 
transferring the patient by private car. Can you do so? The answer is, yeah, generally yes, but hindsight's always 20-20. The government may always question you about that. If you're going to doc transfer a patient by private car, you should do the following and document it. Document that the method of transportation is appropriate under the circumstances, or if you think that the patient really needs an ambulance, I would go ahead and make sure that you offered the appropriate transfer to the patient and the patient turned it down. Make sure you include it kind of as an AMA form that you explain the risks and the benefits and the patient turned it down. Regardless, even if you want to, even if the patient wants to go by private car, I would always offer the ambulance and document the pa that the patient turned the ambulance down. If you're sending them by private car, ensure the patient's accompanied by an appropriate family member, friend, or other person who can help the patient, uh, who can drive, and make sure the patient gets to where they're going. Make sure you give appropriate instructions and document the same, such as go directly to the other facility. This is what you need to do. You know, don't go home first. Don't pick up other stuff. Don't go to the movie beforehand. Give appropriate instructions and document that you gave appropriate instructions. And if the patient refused to comply with your suggestion that they received ambulance, or that they get transferred by the ambulance, document the patient's refusal. Speaking of refusal, what do you do with the patient who refuses to get the exam or treatment that you think is necessary? Well, if, uh, Intella does not give you the right to throw the patient on the gurney, strap them down, and provide care contrary to the patient's wishes, but Intella says that if the patient refuses exam or treatment that you should document the following. You should offer the exam, treatment, or transfer. You should document the exam, treatment, or transfer that was refused. So you tell the patient, hey, we want to do this, and then you document that this is what we offered the patient. Document that the risks and benefits were explained to the patient. Document the basis for refusal of the transfer. If that patient doesn't want to do that because they don't want to pay the bill, they don't want to do something else, document that you told the patient that you're obligated to provide the care regardless of their ability to pay, not necessarily that they're not obligated to pay, but that you are obligated to provide the care regardless of their ability to pay. Um, take reasonable steps to secure written informed refusal. If the patient refuses to sign, then document why they, the patient refused to sign. The bottom line is do an appropriate AMA. Uh, when it comes to the patient's refusal of care, the government says, look, we don't want you kind of nudging the patient out the door. We don't want you coercing patients into refusing care or leaving the hospital by, for example, informing them that they will have to pay for their own care if they remain, but that their care will be free or their lower case if they transfer to another hospital. They, they don't want you suggesting that this patient should leave. Now, the net result is you've got to be careful in your conversations with patients. If the patient asks you questions, you can respond truthfully, don't hide the information, but always make sure that they understand you're obligated to provide the care regardless of their ability to pay. EMTALA requires that you provide prompt examination or treatment. You cannot delay or discourage the examination or treatment to inquire about payment. You cannot seek preauthorization from an insurer until after you have conducted the exam and initiated stabilizing treatment. And as I mentioned, you should not suggest to the patient that they should leave or they could uh, receive services elsewhere at a cheaper cost, or that the insurance may not cover the treatment that you would like to provide. Well, what can you do? Well, so long as it does not delay or discourage the exam or treatment, the hospital may follow reasonable registration processes, such as obtaining demographic information, obtaining insurance information or the insurance card, identifying an emergency contact, those types of things, but make sure that you don't condition that treatment on insurance or their ability to pay. You may contact the primary physician or a health plan to obtain history or identify needs, but you cannot seek pre-authorization. You're contacting them to get information that will allow you to provide the treatment, not to get pre-authorization. You can't get pre-authorization until you've begun the exam and treatment. You should arrange to have a knowledgeable person answer questions about the payment so that it's somebody who understands the rules, understands the interpretive guidelines, and understands what they can and cannot say to get you into, to keep you square with EMTALA. All right, that summarizes the obligations of a hospital with a dedicated emergency department.
What about if you are not a hospital with a dedicated emergency department, but you are a specialized hospital, a hospital with specialized capabilities that participates in Medicare? Well, in that situation, then, you have an obligation to receive transfers from Medicare hospitals if you are in, have, well, actually any hospital, if you are participating in Medicare and you have specialized capabilities. That could be specialized equipment, such as, or a specialized unit like mental health, NICU, a burn unit, et cetera, or it may be specialized capabilities um, based on the particular circumstances. So maybe the transferring facility is overrun. They don't have any more room. Or maybe they're suffering a power outage. In that situation, even though you know, normally have specialized capabilities, under those particular circumstances you have specialized capabilities, and, and you for, therefore you would be obligated to accept that transfer. If you don't, that would be an EMTALA violation. You could uh, lose your uh, participation in Medicare. Now you may refuse transfers if you don't have specialized capabilities. If the transferring hospital has the same capabilities as you do, you're not obligated under EMTALA to accept the transfer. If the transferring hospital uh, admitted the patient as an inpatient, remember, once that once the hospital admits the patient as an inpatient, EMTALA ends not only for that hospital, but also to the receiving hospitals. So if that patient has been admitted as an inpatient, then you're not obligated to accept EMTALA. That's kind of a squirrely rule. I don't necessarily agree with it, but nevertheless, that is the rule. That's the way the rule works. If you are a receiving facility, or if you are a facility to whom that patient shows up, you want to be careful about admitting that patient if you know that that patient's going to need to go for care someplace else. Because once you admit him, EMTALA ends for your obligations and also that receiving, um, that receiving facility's obligations. So if you know you're going to send that patient out, you probably don't want to admit that patient because you want to make sure that you can send that patient on and that receiving facility is obligated to accept that patient. Also, you're not obligated to receive transfers from outside the United States. Well, what happens if you're a receiving hospital and you received an improper EMTALA transfer? Well, then you have an affirmative obligation to notify CMS or state servers, uh, surveyors if you uh, believe that you've received an improper transfer. Either the other hospital dumped the patient or the other hospital refused care and that patient showed up at your facility or the other hospital sent an unstabilized patient without an appropriate transfer. You have an obligation to narc on that other facility. You do not have an obligation to narc on yourself. If you are a hospital with a dedicated emergency department, you provide, you, that patient showed up, you did an improper transfer, you are not obligated to narc on yourself. You only have to report if you are the recipient hospital to receive that. Now, if you are the hospital who did an inappropriate transfer or you violated EMTALA and you know somebody else is going to report you, you may want to voluntarily self-disclose because that may put you in better stead with the surveyors or the regulators, but you're not obligated to do so. If you are a receiving facility that's received an improper transfer, you've got to do the report or else you could be subject to EMTALA sanctions under the interpretive guidelines, although it's not in the rules. Under the interpretive guidelines, they say that you've got to report within 72 hours. If you think that you have received an improper report, the best thing to do is to call the, uh, uh, the transferring facility and make sure that you really did get the, the patient in properly. Um, usually when you call the receiving or the transferring facility, there's additional facts. And once you work through the facts, you may conclude, well, the patient was stable, the patient refused care, or there may be other reasons why there was not an improper transfer. We would just as soon not get CMS involved if we don't have to. And therefore, it's usually better to try to confirm whether there was a, an improper transfer before you actually make the report to CMS. All right, let's talk about on-call responsibilities. Uh, hospitals, all hospitals that participate in Medicare have to maintain an appropriate on-call list of medical staff members who are available to provide screening exam and stabilizing treatment, including receiving facilities. If they receive a, a patient through a transfer that they're obligated to take, they've got to have an on-call list for, for physicians who can show up. 
Now, as far as the sufficiency of that on-call list, hospitals have a lot of flexibility in how they structure that. For example, there is no rule of three. Some people said, well, if you've got three specialists at your facility, you've got to provide 24-7 coverage because you've, you know, got each physician can participate, you know, one in three days or eight hours. That is not the case. You're not required to have 24-7. You're not required to have, uh, there is no rule of three. You're not required to have coverage for all specialties. Now, with that said, in the guidance, CMS did say that if you provide or offer a certain services at the facility, like cardiac services, then CMS would normally expect you to have call coverage for that specialty. It may be that you don't have enough call uh, specialists to provide 24-7 coverage, but maybe you could do one in three, or you could arrange for other types of call services. The bottom line is the government doesn't want to get too prescriptive on how you maintain your call coverage list because hospitals are different. Um, a major trauma center would probably be required to have more call coverage than, for example, a critical access hospital that can't afford to have call coverage all the time. CMS will look at the overall circumstances and determine whether or not you have complied with your call coverage obligations. You must have written policies and procedures to respond if the specialty or on-call physician is not available, whether that's implementing appropriate transfers, having transfer agreements, or notify the EMS to let them know if you don't have uh, call coverage services available. If you decide to permit on-call physicians to schedule services elsewhere uh, or take call elsewhere, you've got to have policies that uh, uh, tell what you do if that physician is not available because they're providing services elsewhere. By the way, if you are going to uh, allow a physician and you're paying on-call for that physician, um, to be on call, but you're allowing that physician to provide services elsewhere at the same time, you better check with uh, your whoever helps you with your cost reimbursement because that may be able to violate the cost reimbursement rules. The government doesn't want to see double dipping in those situations. When it comes to on call responsibilities, not all medical staff members are required to take call. You must maintain the on-call list by individual, not by group. So you put down the specific physician who is on call so that the ED knows to call that particular physician, not the group. That's because the government wants to know who is the specific individual who's responsible for responding to call. You should require physicians to respond within a set period of time, for example, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is that you want. The guidelines suggest that they want to see some kind of definitive time limit for that physician to respond. Just simply responding when, whenever the physician gets around to it probably isn't enough. You may use telemedicine if you want to allow it for the physician to respond. The on-call physician should come to the hospital, not have the patient sent to his office. Sometimes you'll have a situation where the orthopedist says, well, just send him over to my office. No, that's not good enough. The guidance specifically says that the obligation is for that physician to go to the hospital. And a possible exception exists if that orthopedist or that other specialist, usually it's an ophthalmologist, has specialized equipment at their office that that patient needs. In that situation, you could do an appropriate transfer to that uh, physician's office and then the, the patient could be transferred back afterwards. If your policy is permitted, on-call physicians may send a mid-level to respond in their place, but the on-call physician remains responsible. That means if the ED says, no, we want you, not your mid-level, then that physician better respond. If the treating physician determines that the on-call physician should respond in person, that on-call physician should do so. Uh, ties go to the ED physician. If that phys on-call physician refuses to respond when the ED physician requests it, that's probably going to be an EMTALA violation. Um, beware informal call lists, especially in smaller rural facilities, you'll have situations where the physician says, well, I really don't want to be on call, but you're welcome to call me if and if I'm available, I'll go ahead and respond. If you're going to do that, by all means, do not put the physician's name on the on-call list. If they're on the on-call list, the official on-call list, they better be available and on-call. If they fail to respond and they're on the on-call list, they can be subject to that $50,000 fine. So be careful about those informal situations. If the on-call physician fails to respond, the hospital and the on-call physician could be subject to EMTALA penalties. If that hospital has to transfer that patient because the on-call physician failed to respond, 
then that on-call physician has to send, along with the other paperwork, the name of the on-call physician who refused to respond. If you're a hospital, to be safe, you should establish your call coverage policies, address call coverage requirements and bylaws and policies and contracts, train and retrain your medical staff and enforce call coverage responsibilities. Um, Impala does allow you to come up with a community call plan. If you want to do a community call plan between hospitals, make sure you check the regulations and guidance on that. Let's talk briefly about documentation. Impala requires you to post two forms of documentation. The first is you've got to have your Impala signage in your ED and other places where the patients are likely to see it. And in addition, you've got to maintain a central log in your ED or elsewhere of with all patients who come to the ED seeking treatment, whether that patient refused treatment, whether that patient was refused treatment, whether the patient was treated, stabilized, and then transferred or discharged. Now, you've got flexibility in how you maintain that log, but just make sure you maintain it appropriately because that's going to be one of the first things that your surveyors are going to ask to see if they come to check on you. That central log should include records from other areas like pediatrics, labor and delivery, other places where patients may show up to receive emergency care. You've got to maintain your records, your EMTALA records for five years, including records concerning individuals who are transferred to or from the hospital. All right, in my final few minutes, let's talk about some of the things you should do to avoid EMTALA penalties. Well, first, let's talk about whether EMTALA penalties can be imposed. Uh, I already talked about that, but the, the amount of the penalties depend upon certain factors, including the degree of culpability, the seriousness of the patient's condition, the existence of prior violations, the hospital's financial conditions, the nature and circumstances of the particular incident, and other factors as, factors as justice requires. This is important because if there was an EMTALA violation and you need to go back to the government and plead your case, you're going to want to consider these factors in arguing your, your situation to the government to make sure that they don't impose penalties. All right, now let's talk about what you need to avoid penalties. First and foremost, if you remember nothing else about what I said today, remember this. Always do what's in the best interest of the patient and document it. If you do what's in the best clinical interest of the patient and you document it, Almost always, you're going to be in fine from an EMTALA perspective. I've had Region 10 actually tell us, hey, as long as you do what's in best interest of the patient and document it, you're never going to have a problem with them. That means document an appropriate screening exam, including performed by uh, one that's performed by a QMP that addressed the presenting symptoms and that reflected ongoing monitoring. Document whether the patient had an emergency medical condition, whether the patient was stabilized, whether the patient received um, an appropriate transfer, including a physician certification that the risks outweigh the benefits if the patient didn't request the transfer, or if the patient refused care or left AMA, make sure that you document all of that. You should maintain your written EMTALA policies and forms. I've given you some samples. You should train and retrain your staff regarding EMTALA compliance. I have had situations where the government went after hospitals for EMTALA penalties, but we were able to show them that we had a rogue physician that we shouldn't be responsible for because we provided the training, we provided the policies, the government said, you're right, we are not going to go after you for penalties because of this particular situation because you did what you should do. Make sure that you've got the required EMTALA signs posted. Make sure that you've got your acute qualified medical personnel identified in documents approved by the governing board and that they are the entities who are performing screening exams and that those screening exams are not performed by non-QMPs. You can use QMPs to, or non-QMPs to help you perform the exam, but the exam has to be documented and um, concluded by the QMP. Maintain and periodically review your ED log to ensure you're complying with EMTALA. No when EMTALA does and does not apply. Remember, EMTALA applies if the person's on the hospital property requesting care or the person's in a hospital or inbound ambulance. It does not apply to inpatients or outpatients or non-emergency care. But even if EMTALA doesn't apply, it really behooves you to comply with the EMTALA standards. So even if EMTALA doesn't apply, still jump through the right transfer hoops. Document appropriate screening exams and document uh, stabilizing treatment. That's just good protection from risk management malpractice liability type situations. 
Beware transfers by private cars. Beware inbound ambulances. Again, in the inbound ambulance situation, if that patient, you feel like they need to go someplace else, make sure that you do not divert them unless you're on diversionary status. You can talk to them about what the patient needs, but make sure it's clear you're not diverting them. Beware requests or transfers to your facility. Uh, generally, you are obligated to, record, to receive those patients if you have specialized capabilities. If you're going to refuse it because you don't think you have specialized capabilities, you're doing it that at your risk, you're going to want to document that. If you think that there was a suspected violation, immediately respond. That means gather and confirm the facts, including the documents and witness statements, supplement the record as appropriate, impose sanctions if it's appropriate, and provide additional training. Uh, when you are um, investigating these situations, if your documentation is not sufficient, supplement the documentation. Do an appropriate late entry. Make sure the documentation is adequate and appropriate to the circumstances. Don't falsify the information, but you can always do late entries and appropriate documentation to show that you provided the appropriate care. If you think there's a violation, there is no duty to self-report. You only have to report if you received an improper transfer, but if you think somebody else is going to report you, you may want to go ahead and self-report yourself. If the government investigates, cooperate with the investigation, gather and supplement with important facts, get additional witness statements if necessary, if, it doesn't re if it's not reflected in the record, so you can supplement the record as appropriate, implement an appropriate plan of corrections, respond with your version of the facts. If there was no EMTALA violation, explain why. If there was an EMTALA violation, then explain why you should not be penalized, including the fact that you had appropriate policies in place, you provided appropriate training, you simply had a rogue employee, and that you took appropriate action afterwards to make sure this never comes up again. But remember, you're going to be okay under EMTALA as long as you establish appropriate policies, do what's in the best interest of the patient, and document the reasons for your actions. Additional resources. The government has its EMTALA website. You can go and access that. It has guidance concerning EMTALA issues. Um, I've provided you uh, written materials. If you need copies of those, you didn't receive them, just let me know. As far as future webinars, uh, we've got a couple of webinars coming up. In uh, December 6th, we're going to be talking about conducting and documenting a HIPAA security risk assessment. In uh, December 15th, we're going to be talking about the new nursing home conditions of participation. Um, we are in the process of setting up our schedule for 2017. If there are particular issues you would like to see us address, by all means, let us know. If you would like to sign up to get alerts for future webinars or uh, copies of our client alerts that we send out, just send me an email and we'll make sure you get added to that list. That is it. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have a very good week, what's left, and a good weekend, and a great Thanksgiving.